COVID-19 has pushed us online in unprecedented numbers and will change the way we use the internet forever. But it has also shone a light on the gaping digital divide, especially around e-commerce. The truth is, some people and nations are better equipped to take advantage of e-commerce than others. But this does not need to be the case, and people like Nina Angelovska, Macedonian entrepreneur and UNCTAD e-trade for women advocate, are working to close the digital divide. They're focused on unlocking e-commerce's potential and ensuring that women play a leading role in doing so. Nina is the founder of the massive online shopping platform Grouper, president of North Macedonia's e-commerce association and the former Macedonian Minister of Finance. Nina, a warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me see me on this podcast. What set you on your digital entrepreneurship journey at the young age of just 22? Oh, well, I, I developed a passion for e-commerce and the digital world in general during my studies at the Faculty of Economics. I was studying at the e-business department. I was 21 years old when I graduated as student of the year, and it was the same year when um, I won the most innovative business plan competition when I was awarded a small grant to start my business. And actually, this is how I embarked on my entrepreneurial journey. So the business model of uh, group buying was a newly introduced business model that got my attention. And at that time, e-commerce was almost non-existent in my in my country. There was lack of usage of payment cards, no habits for online buying or online selling, etc. all sorts of, of obstacles. So having this in mind, the analysis practically were not in favor of launching an e-commerce business at that time. And it's pretty understandable why most of the people and friends with whom I shared the idea about Grouper were pretty skeptical. But we were enthusiastic that we will change the e-commerce market and uh, give people a good reason to shop online, which at that time was the discounts that acted as the main incentive, you know, to give people the opportunity to, to save money while exploring new things. So we launched Grouper in January 2011 as the first build platform in North Macedonia. We were developing a business in a completely new field and there were many obstacles that we faced. They were, of course, not not a surprise having in mind that this was a completely new field. But I think we were constantly learning, adapting, you know, pulling and pushing and every challenge made us uh, stronger, actually. So from today's perspective, I am truly grateful for all the challenges and all the struggles because those made me who I am, uh, gave us more knowledge over the time and more strength to overcome the next and next and next challenges that were on the way. Uh, Grouper today is recognized as the game changer on the market. We practically educated thousands of customers to make their first online transaction on Grouper and hundreds of merchants joined the e-world and started selling for the first time on Grouper. A month ago, actually, Grouper marked its 10-year anniversary And today, it is much more than a deal platform, serving over 250,000 users in cooperation with more than 3,500 merchants, Amy. What a catalytic business to have started. I'm sure you're just incredibly proud, but you're more than just an entrepreneur, right? You've also been on the policy making side and worked in government. You're lucky enough to have seen both sides of the ecosystem and to have benefited from it, like the grant that you got. Tell me about policy and and how policy can make a difference for e-entrepreneurs or business people having seen both of these sides. Uh, Yes, I think that actually the private sector now having seen both sides uh, is where the magic happens, where value is being created. And the public sector is in a great deal responsible for creating this enabling environment for that magic to happen and greater value to be to be created. So um, it should make life easier for business people, for entrepreneurs on one hand. And on the other hand, through policies, it should stimulate and foster growth. So through potential can be really unlocked. 
Uh, that being said, of course, policy can make all the difference. We see countries, for instance, like that are role models for many, like Estonia for digitalization, or Israel for startups and tech, and so on. And this is uh, uh, due to their bold vision, you know, the policy, the leadership, and the commitment. And actually, this opportunity to be able to make a difference from the inside. Uh, was the key motive for me to accept this huge challenge and responsibility I was given to be able to contribute towards the progress of my country, to put all my passion, all I know, all I can do for the good of the country and to try to make a change, as I said, from the from the inside, because previously I've been pushing for change from the outside. So, uh, as, as I said, I think, as, as, as you uh, mentioned, actually, my career uh, path uh, took a sharp turn when I was invited by the Prime Minister Zoran Zaev to join the government as a finance minister. I was actually the first woman in this position, and um, I headed the public finances of our country during the biggest crisis of all times. The, the pandemic called for bold and quick decisions to navigate the best in the unpredictability and we designed many COVID measures to support the business sector, to support the small businesses, the entrepreneurs, the people. And when we designed these measures, it was not only uh, the what, but also the why and the how. So for instance, with one of the measures that was aiming to stimulate domestic consumption by giving financial assistance to targeted groups of people, we designed this measure in a way not only that the people get the support, but uh, they get it via payment card so that they are able to spend it directed towards the affected sectors, aiming to also achieve more systematic uh, goals and effects like spending, uh, speeding our way towards cashless society, more payment um, card usage and so on. So um, instead of the old traditional ways to ask people to go and fill forms and apply at the government institutions, we use the data and transpar transparently selected the groups that were got this, their payment cards either at the banks or delivered at home. So this is only one example that I, I was trying you know, to induce changes wherever possible, e uh, even though we were managing the biggest crisis, as I mentioned. And I induced changes in the way, for instance, measures are designed and implemented. I was striving to speed up our digitalization and to debureaucratize many processes. And I, you know, I really hope that this will stick and be practiced in, in future as well. It's fascinating that you brought your entrepreneurial approach to to the business of government as well. And I, I, I'm sure the Macedonian people will see the impact down the line. Let's go back to your entrepreneurial journey and reflect on a couple of the challenges, barriers, silos and, and glass ceilings, among other ceilings that you encountered on your entrepreneurial journey. If you, and then if you had some advice to give to a young entrepreneur looking at you and your amazing career and what you've done in, in such a, a short amount of time, what would you say to someone who's wondering, how did you do it? Uh, there, there were many, the road was definitely bumpy. There were many challenges. And I think that maybe the key drivers for me was every challenge and problem that appeared on the way. because. I think no matter where we go, you know, there will be problems waiting for us. And especially in a new field, in a new business where uh, the, the the path was not cleared, there were many, uh, many challenges. And uh, I think that the key in life is to find the problems we enjoy solving. I, you know, I think that those of adrenaline or dopamine we get, we get after a solved problem or an overcome challenge is uh, addictive to some extent. So I, I, I think in a great deal, I'm a very self-motivated person and that constant learning experiences, those struggles, the passion for, for change and progress is what what have kept me and what still keeps me alive and kicking. So I would say to that young entrepreneur, uh, I think I would just say, just keep wondering, never stop learning because no one can take away our knowledge and experiences and passion. And at the end of the day, these are the things, you know, that makes us unique and that truly define who we are. I hear you. And I'm sure it must have, the journey must have been made difficult at some points or at stages by, by being a woman and a woman trying to break down so many barriers and smash those, those glass ceilings. Um, 
do we need more women in the digital economy? And what's at stake if we don't involve more women e-entrepreneurs in this journey from your perspective? Well, I think the growth of our economies is definitely at stake if we don't involve more women. There is so much potential to be unlocked if we have more women entrepreneurs, more women in tech, more women in leadership positions and policy making. And uh, the countries that create the right environment for women to flourish and show what they can really do, I believe, strongly believe actually, that these are the ones that will enjoy faster, more sustainable and definitely more inclusive growth. Uh, since 2019, you've been our shining light at UNCTAD with uh, six other women digital entrepreneurs as an UNCTAD E-Trade for Women Advocates. Tell us a little bit about your role and how you think it's helped both you and other women e-entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great honor to be able to inspire and empower women and it's interesting that uh, when I was appointed as an advocate, it was the same or a month or just a few weeks ahead, I was appointed Minister of Finance. And um, I was, uh, as, as an advocate, I was happy to host the first masterclass in North Macedonia as part of the series of uh, masterclasses under the e Treat for Women initiative. Uh, so we brought together around 50 women entrepreneurs from the region. And in uh, in these years and previously, you know, I have mentored many entrepreneurs that are women and spoke, spoken to lots of events aiming to encourage women and uh, women and girls. And I, I think that the impact itself, it's not very easy to, you know, quantify or measure, but by these messages I get, by the emails and um, uh, from uh, that I get from, from people that I've either mentored or that I have uh, listened to me at some of the events or uh, have asked for advice, you know, I uh, to know that I've encouraged or motivated someone to make a step or to put themselves out there or to aim higher is truly a reward and motivation for me. And sometimes it is these small intangible steps that matter in life that can be a beginning to, to something bigger, actually. And sometimes they actually mean much more than the, the big accolades and the big achievements. Looking ahead into 2021 and beyond, we're walking into a whole new world shaped by the COVID-19 crisis. In your view, what does the picture look like for digital businesses in the post-coronavirus world? Uh, the, the coronavirus definitely presented challenges, but also uh, it presented opportunities like no other for fast-tracking digitalization and e-commerce. Uh, however, not all small businesses were able to capitalize on these opportunities, and this same, of course, applies to governments. For instance, uh, businesses with an, that already had an established online presence have been better equipped to take advantage of, of the increased demand. Um, retailers that have been previously online uh, also got some um, naturally made gains, other, of course, not, not speaking about the affected sectors such as travel and tourism. And on the other hand, uh, the traditional, the brick and mortar businesses that, uh, that were only offline with physical locations, but who were able to quickly adopt and open online sales, managed to compensate for that uh, decline in sales at the physical stores. And at the end of the day, those that did not adopt have remained uh, fully offline. Those are the ones that have been uh, worst hit. So I, I think the pandemic revealed many of the underlying weaknesses that previously existed in our societies, ranging from readiness for the digital economy to the ability to apply solutions, digital solutions quickly. Uh, for instance, the overall digital skills of our population in North Macedonia is very low, and this was a key challenge and still is. However, for, according to the analysis we made at the e-commerce Macedonian Association, we were evaluating the impact of COVID on the behavior of e-customers. And uh, around 20% out of almost 3,000 respondents say that they started paying their bills online using new digital services or shopping online or have increased the amount of uh, online shopping. So I think that, you know, we have been speaking about digital transformation for quite some time, but I really think this is, it has finally begun with COVID in the developing uh, countries. 
So COVID accelerated this uh, because for the first time, people, businesses, governments had no other option but to go digital. It, it was not about it's more convenient, you'll save time, you'll save money, but it was about about the health to protect uh to protect yourself and there were restrictive measures imposed by the government and i think this is actually what accelerated the digital transformation adaptation and uh, you know usage of uh, and, and e-commerce especially so digital technologies and e-commerce can play a key role in strengthening economic resilience and recovering covid times for instance some countries like the usa and the uk reached their forecasted three and five years growth in e-commerce in only a few COVID months. Uh, in North Macedonia, for instance, where 36% of the internet users shop online, we noted over 170% uh, increase in online transactions in the third quarter of 2020 compared to previous year. Uh, however, businesses in developing countries need, I think, to become better equipped for the digital economy. And of course, this will require accelerated digitalization of small companies, micro and small companies, more attention to digital entrepreneurship, um, more skills, improved capabilities to use digital platforms, and of course, stronger regulatory frameworks to promote the creation and capture of, uh, of value in the digital economy. So in the post-coronavirus world, I would say businesses definitely would be more competitive due to this. Uh, adaptation, new skills gained, uh, uh, and will be better equipped for the digital world. Uh, societies will, of course, have better digital skills due to all this uh, period that was happening. And I think we can finally see that shift towards towards a digital future. Definitely. I think in the future, we're going to look back at this moment as that turning point for, for complete digitalization. Speaking of the future, you've had this amazing career. What's next for you? Are you going to conquer the world? <laughs> the, uh, thank you, Amy. I I will definitely keep you updated about uh, uh, about uh, next plans. But in the meantime, I one thing I know for sure is that I will keep pushing for change for digital transformation. I'll keep striving to inspire and motivate as many women I can because we really need to unlock the powerful synergy of women entrepreneurship and, and tech. I agree wholeheartedly and feel very inspired by you myself. Perhaps I'll become an e-entrepreneur in the future. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, Nina. E-commerce is certainly a game changer, but it also can be an equalizer. Nina showed us this and that women are playing a crucial role in digital transformation. We need more seats for them at the table. For more information on our program to make sure that women have a seat at the policy making table in e-trade, contact us on women at etradeforall.org.